Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business. Black Letter, the name, comes from the Gothic typeset. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law books said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify black letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. Welcome back to another episode of the Black Letter Podcast. I've got Jason Levin with me again. We're talking about his relatively new book written during COVID. We talked about it last time and a little bit of his background. This week, we're going to talk to Jason about a particular challenge or struggle that he's overcome. Interestingly, we learned last week that the book he wrote, the things he talks about that are challenges for 99.9% of the world are DNA and natural to him and not challenges to him. So it'll be interesting to hear what challenges he's had and overcome. Probably zero. So maybe this is a really short episode. But Jason, I'm going to turn back to you now and ask you, uh, and I know we gave you some time to think about this. So maybe you're like, I did think of one thing that's challenged me in life or in my business, or in writing my book, whatever it was. But I'd like to flip the mic to you. You know, Tom, I, uh, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate all the background. And, and, and I say to you that, you know, I'm a human being like everybody else. And I always quote, wasn't comfortable with the relationship piece. Uh, I too had to make my own mistakes. I too had to go through my own uncertainties. Uh, and my own trial and error. I think for me, the the seminal learning, you know, if you want, we can go back to college. I mean, that's where it all started. You know, after getting into campaigns for student elections, which got me more comfortable in getting over my fear of interacting um, and engaging with folks, was how I got, um, you know, I talk about this in the book on how I, uh, actually, I don't talk about this story in the book, but how I got my uh, internship in Paris at the U.S. Embassy between my junior and senior year of college. And the the reason I wanted uh, this opportunity so much is that when my father lost his job when I was in high school, we went through a whole host of things during the recession of 89, 90. And so being a child, child, I was in high school, but having, having seen my parents experience a recession and really live through the uncertainties of not having income in the door, and it was a prolonged unemployment, really impacted me. Uh, and it really got me thinking in a way that, uh, you know, you were saying that, I, I, uh, you know, in the last uh, segment that I was a little bit mature. Well, I mean, when I was 15 and my dad was going through unemployment, I was like, all right, I need to figure this out. And I was reading the Wall Street Journal and Forbes and Fortune. And, okay. and so, so at the beginning of my junior year of college, I said, you know what, I want to I want to go to France. And the reason I wanted to go to France was that we couldn't afford it during my dad's unemployment. I was in the French club in my uh, high school and we couldn't take this week long trip to France with the French club because, you know, it just didn't make sense Uh, to like, you know, my dad's unemployed and I'm going to France. That's just, you know, that's not going to work. So I made a commitment to myself, my junior year of college that I was going to find something in France the next summer. And the way that I went about it, I was always fascinated with, you know, at the time, why people don't call you back or like how many phone calls does it take to get to that person where they actually respond? And at the time, I was also, I still am. I love Tootsie Pops. Uh, and they're, they're, they're famous. Right. How many licks does it take to get to the center? of yeah. How many licks does it take to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop? And my center of the Tootsie Pop was France. So. You just dated yourself, just so you know. <laughs> don't, my kids have no idea what that is. Anybody under 40 has no idea what that is. Maybe right. 45. Right. Anyway, right. but I get it. Yeah. So, it's so now me, licking a lollipop. Yep. Okay. It's all about licking a lollipop to get to the Tootsie Roll inside the lollipop. So you get like two benefits. You get the initial lollipop, and you get the Tootsie Roll inside. So for me, that France internship was that Tootsie Roll inside. And I started telling everybody, you know, next summer, I wanted to spend it in France. I'd hope to work there. And very early on in September, I got the name of the former speechwriter to the U.S. ambassador to France uh, from one of the board of trustees at my university. And she's like, call him and tell him I, you know, told you so and, you know, see what happens. 
And I did something different though. I set up a, a sheet. I set up a tracking sheet. It was a piece of paper and a pen. And I left a voicemail, but then I jotted it down. And then I set up a reminder system. I said, you know what? He may or may not get back to me, but if he doesn't get back to me, I should really follow up on this because this is something I really care about. And so right. I got it. I was make I was, you know, again, this is mid nineties. So the email, email didn't really exist in, in connecting and reconnecting. So over a six month period, I probably left between 10 and 15 voicemails. Uh, wow. Where, and, and again, process, right? I've got my tracking file, wow. which is like uh, notes and taking notes. I've got my paper calendar, follow up, left message, follow up, left message. And what were your Mark, messages? We're like, hey, it's Jason. I've called you 11 times. I'm calling you a 12th time just to let you know I'm still very interested. So because I was thinking about why people don't get back in touch with you, I was thinking about from his perspective. I'm like, what's going on in his life right now that he's not calling me back? So I did the exact opposite. I said, you know okay. what? Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my voicemail. It's Jason Levin once again. Uh, we have so-and-so in common. She's really great. I just saw her. We talked about X. I'd still love to get a conversation with you. Calls me back in March after like 10 or 15 of these voicemails. And wow. he says, you know, it seems like you really want to go to France. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you so convinced him. And so this is back. And if, if I don't bring you to France, you're going to come to my house. <laughs> I'm going to go. Yeah. Okay, exactly. Something strange is going to happen. Yeah. Something it's, strange. Maybe a little happen. fearful. You know, we'll move in together and, uh, you know, I'm going to become like your best friend. And he said, you know, let me do this. Let me reach out to some of my colleagues. And sure enough, he did what he said he was going to do. Uh, and it took a couple more weeks. He's like, all right, here's the fax number to the folks. So like, you know, when you're, my first time I sent an international fax, we had to do the zero. Wow. Uh, and wait, and wait. So hold on a minute, Jason, for everyone out there who doesn't know what a fax machine is, <laughs> it's what your copier does now. It's like an email with an attachment, but there's no, and the cover sheet would be the email and it came out in paper. Right. So that's, you know, for everyone under 30. Right. Okay. okay right. Now we're good. Yeah. And then the phone rang two days later. And it's not like your regular phone. It goes beep, beep. And it was the first time I had heard an international a European phone, phone ring. <laughs> That's and hilarious. It, it was the U.S. Embassy in Paris. And they said, well, you know, we heard from, you know, our former colleague. Uh, and again, this was pre 9-11. So there were no background checks. She, she's, she said, listen, you know, the internship program is already set and done. But we do have an opening in the ambassador's residence. The fact you have an accounting background, we do need some help. Our finance manager needs some help. We just, you know, you need to come over here. Um, you know, you have an opportunity, but you have to figure out your own way. Uh, and so I ended up figuring that out. I ended up living in a Paris youth hostel for a couple of weeks, you know, going wow. back and forth. Good times. And then my finance manager like really felt bad for me and he saw how hard I was working and he convinced the staff to move me into the ambassador's residence. And so, wow. so the summer of 1996, my address was the U.S. ambassador's residence where I was living with the cooks and the maids. <laughs> that is kind of cool still. That's pretty neat. So when you talk about the silence, the overcoming yourself, the consistency, all those kinds of things. When I think about Paris and like one of my favorite experiences was on July 14th, they had like this Bastille Day event and the U.S. Embassy was bringing in the board of directors of Monticello. And we were right. taking them all around it and ended up having a dinner inside the Eiffel Tower with the fireworks going off, like the best view of the fireworks. Inside that is the an expensive restaurant. I've been there. Yeah, that's and crazy. So I, and I, and I, and I made a promise to myself at that moment where I'm watching the fireworks and I'm like, I love this. I love how I feel right now. I love all these opportunities that have happened. I'm like, I'm going to keep in touch forever. I'm going to set up a whole. And so it got me leaning into more around how I thought about people and who were good to me and who, who could I bring into my world and staying organized. 
Uh, and so for a long time, you know, before I even knew what Excel was, I had like all these people I liked that were like, you know, let me send that person a holiday card. Let me send that wow. person a postcard. Let me, you know, because these are good people that I want to keep in touch with. Yeah. Um, so that was my moment of like overcoming something that was really important to me because like the entire time I'm leaving voicemails, I'm like, is this guy really going to call me back? I'm like, is this yeah. guy actually like, am I going to, is this real? And you know, all those things that go on in your head, but on the other side, I'm like, all right, pick up the phone again, see what's inside the Tootsie Pop and let's, you know, let's make it happen. So that was my, that was for me a seminal moment that has kicked off all these other dominoes and how I think about relationships and follow up and connection and all those kinds of things. So do you speak French? Tu parles français maintenant ou non? Ah, je parle français. Monsieur parle français aussi? Ah oui, je crois. C'était longtemps pour moi, mais j'ai fait l'école secondaire en Suisse, à Genève. Quand j'ai 14 ans, à 17, 17, oui. Et donc, comme vous habitez en Suisse, vous aimez la raclette? Oui, bien sûr. <laughs> Et toi aussi, toi-même. <laughs> I think that, that most of our people listening probably don't speak French. But yes, I love raclette, I love fondue, and I have a raclette set. And it's funny because I have a lot of friends, right? We actually have two, because um, my mom gave me hers. Uh, she had two. Anyway, long story. It was a 220 volt from when we lived there, and I just redid the electrics on it. So, uh, but yeah. We have a raclette set. So like, what is raclette? So I've introduced raclette to like a couple hundred people in America over time, and including my daughter's Chinese friend. He, he is, now, when he comes to visit us, I think we're sending raclette to China. So I'm yeah. oddly an ambassador for Swiss cuisine, which is not a haute cuisine, probably, in most of the world. Anyway, sorry, sidetrack. So I want to ask you about this LinkedIn, <laughs> this spreadsheet thing. So, um, uh, yeah, isn't that funny, right? We both speak French. It's crazy. And we have um, a raclette machine, guys. We have a raclette sheet machine. Oh, you do. And we both have raclette, raclette <laughs> machines. That's insane. So, um we can talk later about like your favorite things. Like we use cornichons, potatoes, um, you know, obviously the potatoes, but sometimes obviously. bread, like it's a fondue. Uh, and getting raclette cheese has become so much easier yes. in recent years. I can get it yeah. now at Wegmans and we used to have to buy it from Switzerland or Amazon after that. And anyway, my mom would complain. Uh, so getting back to <laughs> LinkedIn. So let's talk about the Excel spreadsheet. So I looked at your book and in the like towards the end, you have like, do this, make an Excel spreadsheet. Here are the columns you need. Here's how you use it. Here's what you do on LinkedIn. Is there uh, some way, I don't know if maybe you could describe that or is there some resource, people who don't buy your book, obviously it'd be better if they bought your book for the world, but is there some place they can find that information? Does your company have a website? Um, you know, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, my, my, you know, Ready, Set, Launch has a website. I've probably blogged on the right. topic in a multitude of ways. And okay. here's the thing, and, and the reason I talk about an Excel file is the moment that you talk about customer relationship management or contact management system, people's eyes glaze over, right? Well, because they need to buy, I, I will tell you what they do, I, and tell me if I'm wrong. They're like, I need to sign up for Pipedrive, or I need to sign up for some CMR tool that will manage my relationships, and then they don't use the software, and they don't end up, but Excel is just such a, it's like a piece of paper. Right. So, so you know. That's what I, I you know, I always come back to any contact management system or customer relationship management system is a good system if it gets used, right? It has to get used. It has to be adopted, yeah. right? So, but if you're not going to adopt that, then, well, what is that? What do you uh, export to, right? So when you export, you're, it always goes to an Excel file, right? Yeah, the fair. Export, I like that. It, That's the ubiquitous central piece of technology is an Excel file. It is the contact love language, Excel. Fair. It is the, it is the ultimate contact love language. You know, you want, you know, you want to send, you know, a big MailChimp email blast. Get sent to an Excel file, a CSV file. Like, you know, that is the ultimate. That's why I'm like, why are we not talking more about Excel? Why are we not, you know, living in that? And then using that as the, you know, if you don't want to, I, and again, I think, you know, everybody that, you know, in their firm uh, ha, that has a CMS or a CRM, adopt it, try to use it. But at the same time, if you're looking for a simpler version, then 
you just open up a tab and it's just very easy to populate yep. these fields of who are the people in your neighborhood, right? Everybody thinks this takes so much time. It doesn't take a lot of time to open the file and to put a name into an Excel file, like name, address, email, phone, like, you know, yeah. that kind of, st it, it's, it, this is not, this is not, you know, rewriting the Magna Carta. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things, but it's, again, it gets back to the consistency piece. So sure. I'm, you know, in the broadest sense, have a central place to organize all this stuff. So that's why your awesome. LinkedIn profile is not yours. It's still LinkedIn's. So at the end of the day, your Excel file can be your true guide on the people and you can put different tabs or you can keep it at one tab or, you know, this is client, this is friend from college, this is friend from law school. Oh, good idea. And the crossover tabs and the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. you know, uh, then you can use in your Excel file or in your or LinkedIn. One of my favorite sorts is the city sort. You can be doing sorts like, you know, I was just in, uh, doing a, I was doing a speaking engagement in Chicago. So what's the first thing I'm going to do? I'm not going to go to Chicago. I'm doing a sort on who do I know in Chicago, right? That is such a great, I always forget, Jason, and I love this, and this will be my takeaway for this segment, even though you've given me lots of other stuff, like persistence. But for me, I go places all the time. I was just in Austin, and I realized there's like two clients and three or four other people I could have seen, but I went down and did my little conference, got back on the airplane and came home. And I had time. I should have, but I didn't do it. And I could have so, connected with all those people. You just, I mean, that's exactly what ha it happens right. to me all the time. And then higher level stuff. So what I do now, after, you know, so after writing the book, you know what I got back into? I got back into postcards. And so, oh so I was just at a speaking engagement in Vegas. I said, you know what? There's 10 people I want to reconnect with. I made labels from my Excel file. I land wow. in Vegas. I get 10 postcards. I've already got my stamps. And instead of going out one night, I'm writing postcards, right? Oh, oh my gosh. And I mail them from Vegas. And I can't tell you the number of people that like texted me or wrote to me. Oh my God, I haven't got a postcard in so long. Let's catch up. Right. So that's so, amazing. Yeah. So, so, but again, it goes back to, you know, we want LinkedIn to be the solution. We want the CRM to be the solution. We want the Excel file to be the solution. You know what's in here? It's in your heart and it's in your mind, right? then you need to act on all these things and bring yourself to say, you know what? Why don't I communicate with this individual? Why don't I build or rebuild or say hello in some shape or form that I'm thinking of them, right? I love it. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you, Jason, in the next segment to give me your major pieces of advice, all the stuff that we've talked about, all the stuff that you've learned that we've distilled, I'm gonna come back and the one or two or three pieces of advice for businesses, lawyers, professional services, just salespeople or non salespeople, whatever, humans, what pieces of advice do you have for them? So think about that. And for the rest of the audience, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week, but you'll, I'll see Jason. He has three minutes to think of this, maybe five <laughs> minutes. And I'll see Jason in a couple of minutes, but we'll see you next week on another episode of the Black Letter Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Download us, see us on YouTube, listen to us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, uh, iTunes, wherever you get your audio and video. Thanks. See you next time. That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode and check out our website at blackletterstudios.com.